about the supportive therapy for our myeloma patients. Is this working? There we go. Thank you. All right. So we know that myeloma is a highly treatable disease, but at this point in time is considered incurable. Hopefully that will change in our lifetime, right? And so the overall cell rates have significantly improved due to the recent advancements in newly approved novel agents, but with it, survival improvements can lead to more comorbidities for our patients. So the goal of treatment is to control the disease to prolong overall survival, but we also need to preserve quality of life. So understanding what these side effects could be and prompt management of these side effects can really improve quality of life for our patients. So we know that the effects of myeloma itself can affect the bone marrow, can cause myelosuppression. Those plasma cells are overcrowding the bone marrow. It can cause renal dysfunction. You know, those free light chains, those monoclonal antibodies can be really toxic to the kidneys and also bone damage. So for our bones, we know that about 85% of our patients have bone disease. And this is really because these myeloma proteins can upregulate the activity of osteoclasts and kind of suppress osteoblast maturation. You know, those two systems work in together to maintain the bone health. And we can see weakened bone holes in the bones from this exact mechanism of action. So the widespread bone destruction can lead to hypercalcemia. It can cause fractures because the bones are really brittle. We can see sometimes spinal cord compression. We can see these kind of lytic lesions. And sometimes we can see really weakened bones such as osteoporosis and osteopenia. So the mainstay of treatment for bone disease is actually using bisphosphonates for myeloma. And how they work is they inhibit the osteoclast activity and cause osteoclast apoptosis. So it slows down bone destruction. It doesn't really build bone, it just kind of works on those osteoclasts. And it can decrease pain and can also reduce skeletal related events, meaning reduce risk of fractures that can happen with myeloma. And there's also an anti-myeloma benefit to these drugs that we don't entirely understand. Because there was a study that was published in 2013 that looked at the usage of bisphosphonates, particularly Zometa, for patients who had myeloma. And the patients who were on Zometa versus not on Zometa actually live longer. So there is a survival advantage and an anti-myeloma effect to these drugs. So we typically give these, the two drugs that are approved for myeloma, zoledronic acid and pomidronate, are given as IV infusions once a month for usually the first year, and then we'll spread it out thereafter to maybe every three months. And there are pretty rare side effects, but important to note, they can affect kidney function. So it's important to know what your patients creatinine every time you dose these drugs. There's a risk of fractures of the long bones of the femur, and it can be usually bilaterally, and it can, be, it can happen with little to no trauma to the area. So it's really important if your patient's reporting groin pain or thigh pain to investigate to see if they have this fracture, if they've been on bisphosphonates for a long period of time. It can cause flu-like symptoms, maybe within the first three days of getting the drug, typically with your first dose and not really with subsequent dosing. Happens in about 10 to 20% of patients, manifesting as kind of a low-grade fever or chills or body aches can be mitigated with taking something like Tylenol. And then we do see this very rare side effect called osteonecrosis of the jaw, or ONJ. And so the risk is increased with um, more exposure to these drugs and also having a recent uh, invasive dental procedure. So we always tell our patients that if they have to have any sort of major dental work to make sure they get that done before they start bisphosphonate therapy and make sure their dentists know that they're on bisphosphonates because when they are, dentists tend to be a little bit more conservative with the type of treatments that they do because the risks increase if there's exposed bone in the jaw. So maybe tooth extractions or even implants can increase the risk. There was a study that showed that patients who were on Zometa for more than two years and had a dental procedure, they had about a 2% risk of developing ONJ. So it's rare, but it is something that's important to note.
How else we manage bone disease? Well, you know, treat the underlying problem, the myeloma. But we can also do surgical procedures like vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. And they're minimally invasive. So vertebroplasty, they're basically kind of um, reinforcing the collapsed vertebra. And then kyphoplasty is they're inserting a balloon, inflating it in the collapsed vertebra and filling it with a bone like cement. And this is minimally invasive. Patients can get pretty quick relief with this pain relief, maybe within the first month of getting the procedure. And it, there really isn't a hospitalization of all with this, so it's a nice option for our patients who have really painful compression fractures. We can do radiotherapy. It's really only for a select patient population because we know that radiotherapy can affect bone marrow function, but if patients have painful plasmacytomas that could benefit from this will sometimes offer this. And also if we see on imaging that patients have maybe an impending fracture, we'll send them to our orthopedic colleagues to see if they need reinforcement. So the kidneys, we always hammer to our patients that they really have to protect their kidneys, not allow themselves to become dehydrated. And that's because there's several factors at play. So the myeloma can cause cast nephropathy, the hypercalcemia we talked about can uh, affect your renal function, hyperviscosity, and light chain deposition disease and amyloidosis can all, all cause renal dysfunction. And so other causes too, such as other comorbidities, such as hypertension or diabetes, can affect your kidney function function, dehydration, and certain medications. So the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we always tell our patients to stay away from, make sure they're not getting IV contrast, and there are certain drugs that we give them that can affect their renal function too, such as the bisphosphonates. And also some drugs we know we, have to might, we might have to dose reduce due to impaired renal function, such as some of the immunomodulatory agents like lenalidomide. So how do we treat this? We make sure our patients are well hydrated. I always tell my patients that they should be coming into clinic with a bottle of water because they should not allow themselves to get dehydrated. Make sure you correct that hypercalcemia because that can really influence the renal function. And teach your patients not to take non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And make sure they understand what the brand names are and the generic names are because they might not know what they're taking is a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And if they ever see another other physicians who's ordering a CAT scan make sure they tell the physician that it should be without contrast. Sometimes plasmapheresis can help if they have really a lot of monoclonal antibody burden. So you're just kind of sub getting rid of the excess monoclonal antibodies but doing plasmapheresis, but really treating the underlying myeloma is the way to go. And then also dialysis if kidney function is really impaired. So here is a list of the approved agents for the treatment of muscle myeloma. It's not an exhaustive list because I don't have the alkylating drugs that we use such as bendamustine and cyclophosphamide and melphalan and the good old steroids that patients can never get away from. But we have our immunomodulatory agents, we have our proteasome inhibitors, we have our monoclonal antibodies and we have our HDAC inhibitor. So you can see that these drugs, their break, breakdown by class and drug itself, they can cause a slew of side effects for our patients. So cytopenias, increased risk for infection, some GI distress. We can even see issues with you know, their blood sugars from the dexamethasone or prednisone we're giving our patients. We can see even some cardiopulmonary effects. So it's really important to understand all the risks of using these drugs and help prevent some of these side effects that can occur. So peripheral neuropathy, we know that this can happen either from the disease itself or some of the drugs that we give our patients. And it can range from sensory defects to actual neuropathic pain. You know, patients can just notice some intermittent numbness to constant numbness that can manifest to kind of electric shooting pain or pinpricks or a burning sensation that they have in their hands or feet. And so it can happen, like I said, from disease or treatment itself. H amyloid deposition can do it, hyperviscosity can do it, and we know that the incidence of high-grade peripheral neuropathy um, can be mitigated with certain changes in some of the drugs that you use. So bortezomib, we know the risk is decreased if you give bortezomib once a week versus twice a week, and we know it's also decreased if you give it subcutaneously. I can tell you here at Hackensack, we pretty much never give bortezomib intravenously, and we really only give it as a sub-Q injection, because the efficacy is the same, but it's much more um, better tolerated. 
Thalidomide, we know that this is dose dependent, meaning kind of the longer you're on it, the more likely you're able to develop neuropathy. And it's less, it's a little bit harder to reverse neuropathy associated with thalidomide. With bortezomib, we know about one third of patients can have irreversible peripheral neuropathy. So we can help two thirds of a patients if we recognize it early and give them a break. So how do we manage it? If we know it's related to the drug, we might have to modify the dose or the schedule of the drug, meaning if it's from bortezomib, we might wanna change from going twice a week to once a week, or we may need to give the patient a break to see if the neuropathy gets uh, much better. We can also try oral medications such as duloxetine or pregabalin, gabapentin. Um, some of the tricyclic antidepressants can be really helpful like nortriptyline or amitriptyline, and even opiates can sometimes be helpful, but those neuropathic medications seem to be a little bit more beneficial. There's compounded creams that you can use. We don't use them very often. Some patients find them to be a little bit more painful <laughs> than anything else. It usually has a mixture of stuff in there, like a muscle relaxant or a high-dose opiate like ketamine. And then just teaching your patients about really how to protect themselves. So make sure they don't have clutter in the house, if they have trouble walking so they're not tripping over anything. Make sure they're using safety features, maybe installing stuff in their bathroom. Make sure they're using canes and walkers as needed. And if they're having a lot of trouble with their balance, maybe physical therapy can be beneficial. And even calling our neurology colleagues because we know they can do sometimes some EEG, EEG testing to figure out the origin of the neuropathy and see if they have any other better ideas than we do. So clots is a huge issue for cancer patients. We know that cancer patients are inherently hypercoagulable. Myeloma is no different. And we can see our patients can get either DVTs or PEs, sometimes just from the drugs that we're giving them, or just inherently at risk. So we know that these clots can result from kind of an unregulated activation of both the coagulation that occurs with endothelial damage or reduced blood flow and just inherent hypercoagulability. It's important to recognize the signs and symptoms of a clot. It can be very insidious. Sometimes patients can have very um, minimal swelling in their legs, not pain, not heaviness, not redness, and you send them for you know, a Doppler study and they can have bilateral DVTs. So how do we prevent clots? We have to understand what our patient's risk factors are. So obesity, a previous history of a clot, can tell us that they're already inherently hypercoagulable, having a central venous catheter, certain comorbidities, and even certain medications like the erythropoiesis stimulating agents that we give can increase your risk of developing clots. We have certain myeloma related risk factors too, such as hyperviscosity or even certain drugs that we use. And it's important to recognize the risk factor um, where they lie on the scale because doing something like aspirin can be sufficient but if they have more risk factors doing therapeutic, therapeutic anticoagulation is the best way to go. So the best way to manage it is to recognize the risk and prevent it. I can tell you we pretty much use a low dose aspirin for our patients who are low risk but if our patients are at high risk we'll use therapeutic anticoagulation. And we tend to at Hackens act to lean a little bit more to the oral agents, a little bit easier for our patients to avoid taking another shot every day. And also watching how much corticosteroids we use because there was a trial that showed reducing the dose of dexamethasone. There was a trial showing um, high dose dex with Rev or low dose dex with Rev and the patients who had a lower dose of dexamethasone with Revlimid had less clots and actually less infections. We can do Doppler studies or a VQ scan and also if patients develop a clot while they're on therapy, switch them over to therapeutic anticoagulation. So myelosuppression we know is a problem for our patients because the plasma cells are overcrowding the bone marrow and causing these low blood counts. And the drugs that we give them itself can be myelosuppressive. So it's important to recognize the risk and when patients' naders are going to be and anticipate that and make sure they understand what the signs and symptoms of myelosuppression can be. So check those blood counts frequently, particularly during that nadir period. If your patient has po poor bone marrow reserve, maybe you need to check it more frequently while they're on therapy. Make sure they're not on any other medications that can lower their blood counts besides their myeloma therapy. If they're really symptomatic from their anemia, maybe giving them a transfusion to improve their oxygen carrying capacity can be helpful. Trying those erythropoiesis stimulating agents may be useful too. You can try Procrit or Aranesp. And maybe 
look for other underlying issues that can cause anemia, such as deficiency in iron or B12 or folate. We've had a couple of patients develop this kind of um, Coombs negative hemolytic anemia on some of the treatments that we're giving them. So make sure you look for that and correct it if you're seeing a lot of surrogate markers such as hyperbilirubinemia or the anemia is becoming more pronounced. And long-term usage of some of the drugs like the immunomodulator drugs can cause hypothyroidism, which can in turn cause anemia. So make sure you're checking for that too. So for our neutropenic patients, we can offer them growth factor support. More importantly, teach them about infection precautions. You know, I had a patient yesterday who was very neutropenic and um, was very sad that I told him he couldn't have a huge birthday party this weekend because he could develop a life-threatening uh, infection with all his grandchildren who were planning to be at the party. So it's really important to explain to your patients that it's, they really need to avoid large crowds, wash their hands really well. It's so easy for someone to cough, sneeze into their hand, touch a surface. Your patient touches that surface, rubs their eyes, rubs their nose. Make sure they have a thermometer at home. It's so easy to ask your patients if they're experiencing fevers, they'll tell you no. But your second question should be, do you have a thermometer at home? Because sometimes the answer will be no. So how do you know you have a fever if you don't have a thermometer at home? And so make sure patients know that if they do have a fever, it's a medical emergency. So for febrile neutropenics, we have to basically pan culture these people, give them empiric IV antibiotics, Tylenol to bring the fever down. And also for thrombocytopenia, make sure if our patients are really at high risk for spontaneous bleeds with a low platelet count, give them a platelet transfusion. And also make sure we're holding anticoagulation if their platelet count's really low. So infection. We know our patients are really at risk. So the immune deficiency of myeloma patients is caused by many things. So the myelosuppression, they have suppression of their normal immunoglobulins because of that excessive monoclonal antibody that they're producing. They have deficiency in their normal antibody response because that monoclonal antibody that they're producing is kind of non-functional, not helpful for their immune system. There can be a shift in their microbial flora, so they're really at high risk for developing bacterial and viral infections. Myeloma patients have an inherent problem with their humoral immunity. So they're at high risk for encapsulated bacteria infections, such as haemophilus infections and streptococcus. So they're also at risk for zoster, and that's from the myeloma itself. The treatment they get, we give them, such as proteasome inhibitors, daratumumab, and even stem cell transplant. So it's important to recognize this and prevent it. Make sure they're on antiviral prophylaxis. If they develop zoster, recognize it quickly and treat it. So, because the risk is always developing post-herpetic neuralgia, which is really terrible for our patients. And we do not recommend the shingles vaccine for our patients. It's a live vaccine, and our patients should not be getting it. But we can also make sure that we are finding a source of infection if we do suspect one. So sometimes we'll do a respiratory pathogen panel to check for the most common viruses. Um, a lot of my colleagues joke in the office that I order this way too much. But you know, when you have a patient who develops the flu in the middle of the summer and has a, develops a flu in April, I had a patient who developed the flu twice this year um, in the summertime and just in the non-flu season. So it's important to see that these people can be at risk for these kind of opportunistic infections when the general population is fine. Chest x-ray looking for pneumonia, they're really at risk for that. Empiric antibiotics, if you think they do have an infection. Vaccines are important. So getting their seasonal flu vaccine and their pneumonia vaccine is very, very important. They may, may not be able to mount um, the response to these vaccines at a patient who doesn't have myeloma, but there's still a protective benefit there. And if your patients have really, they have chronic infections, chronic sinus infections, respiratory infections, and really low levels of IgG, you may want to offer them intravenous IgG to see if it can help them. If your patients are having a lot of trouble with diarrhea, you may want to do a stool culture to see if they have C. diff or an OMP. Urinalysis and, and urine culture if they're having urinary symptoms, blood cultures, antifungals, growth factors. But I just want to remind you that sometimes patients may not really mount the same kind of immune response to an infection because the corticosteroids can really mask the typical signs and symptoms of an infection. So you really have to be careful and look for insidious things and make sure your patient's not infected. So fatigue. 
So this is one of the most serious complications of myeloma because it really, really reduces quality of life. And it usually starts with diagnosis and just gets worse over time. And it's not the type of fatigue that you and I know after working a long day at work. It's more the type of fatigue that's really not relieved with rest. You know, you and I may be able to take a nap and then get going and feel refreshed. A lot of the times our patients don't feel that way. And they're not really sure, but they think it's due to increased inflammatory cytokines. So it's important to kind of recognize what the risk factors are. So, you know, anemia, nutritional deficiencies, if they're not sleeping well from the steroids we keep hammering into them, even depression. A lot of the time patients say they don't feel depressed, but it's really manifesting as difficulty sleeping and having little interest and no energy and things that they love to do. Pain medication can do it. Just being sedentary can do it. It's just like with babies, right? Sleep begets sleep. So the more you sit, the more tired you're gonna be. And even some hormonal changes can do it too in the myeloma treatment. So we have to tackle it from various standpoints. Correct anemia, if we think that's the cause. If it's drugs doing it, maybe they just need a little bit of a break. You know, these patients are gonna be on treatment probably indefinitely. So maybe they just need a little bit of break just to kind of refill their tank. Um, sleep disruption, disruption can be a big problem. So educate your patients on proper sleep hygiene. Make sure they're not drinking a ton of caffeinated beverages before they go to bed. And try and tell them, you know, if you are trouble, having trouble sleeping, please don't turn on the lights and start vacuuming your house because your body's gonna get confused and think it's time to stay awake and, and be productive for the day. So just try and rest and close your eyes. If it's because their mind's racing a lot at night, maybe giving them a benzodiazepine, but maybe a sleep aid is really where they need to go, such as Ambien or even Lunesta. Sometimes our patients don't have energy because they're just not eating well. So it's really important to lean on our nutrition colleagues. Our nutritionist is fantastic. She can really come up with an individualized treatment plan for our patients. And sometimes patients are dehydrated and they just need IV hydration to help them get going. Depression is a huge problem, can cause fatigue. We have a monthly support group here for our patients, our myeloma patients. It meets the third Thursday of every month. We also have social workers that can help our patients. Sometimes they need more advanced help, such as seeing a psychiatrist or even having psychotherapy. And the demands of cancer care itself are very fatiguing. You know, a lot of our regimens that we give patients makes them come twice a week, sometimes two days in a row three weeks on and one week break. So we're coming to the clinic sometimes six times a month, maybe more than that, if you have to check them more frequently because you're worried about their counts. So patients can be just really exhausted with the cancer care itself. So I always tell my patients, make sure you're leaning on your caregivers to help you with other things that you don't need to do. Run to the grocery store, run to the laundromat. Let them do those things so you can conserve your energy to do more important things such as that holiday dinner or that birthday that you really wanted to have. And make sure they're exercising. So basically exercise is the only thing that's been proven to help with cancer-related fatigue. And a lot of patients just say, you know, I don't have enough energy to exercise, but once you get those natural endorphins pumping, they actually do feel better. Proper pain management as well, and of course check for hormonal imbalances. So GI distress, we see a lot of this with our patients. Most of the time not related to the myeloma itself, but more the treatment that we give them. And there's tons of risk factors here. So for nausea, the hypercalcemia, being constipated, being anxious. We know our female, even our younger female patients are really at risk for nausea. Pain medicine can do it. Constipation, there's lots of risk factors there too, such as uncontrolled diabetes. We forget about that sometimes. Just not eating well can cause constipation and diarrhea, you know, recent exposure to antibiotics can do it. And sometimes people have pre-existing issues like lactose intolerance or irritable bowel syndrome. So how do we manage nausea? So if it's due to drug, we'll try and modify the dose, but we really lean on our supportive medications for this. So, and sometimes it requires drugs from all of these classes. So our 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, our, neuro one recept our neurokinin-1 receptor antagonists, our dopamine receptor antagonists, and sometimes even using the cannabinoids can be helpful for our patients. Using Marinol, particularly if your patient has trouble sleeping and they have a low appetite and trouble with nausea, sometimes Marinol can be 
be really helpful. Maybe the benzodiazepines are a way to go too to add on top of this. Alternative therapies like acupuncture bands or acupressure can be really helpful. And teaching your patient about small frequent meals. A lot of the times patients say, you know, I had my large pasta dinner and I felt really nauseous. Well, maybe you shouldn't have your large pasta dinner. How about small frequent meals just to get that nutrition in and make sure you tolerate it well. And a lot of our patients have trouble with reflux. In fact, one of my patients just stopped me in the hall and said, Amy, I just want you to know I've been having reflux all day today. So I said, well, what are you eating? She was drinking, you know, Coca-Cola and eating a chocolate cookie. So we talked a little bit about sometimes food can exacerbate it, such as caffeine and chocolate. But you know, a lot of the steroids we give our patients can really cause a lot of gastritis. So making sure they might need to be on a PPI or even on an H2 and even, she said she's been chewing Tums all day. So we talked about how to best manage that. Constipation, we forget that the, almost all of our patients are on opiates, and so they can cause a lot of constipation, make sure their diet is appropriate. Um, Relistor can be helpful for opiate-induced constipation. Make sure they're not taking their 5-HT3s very often. And um, diarrhea, make sure you're dose reducing or delaying if you think it's related to drug. Make sure patients are slow down, slow down, slow, um, slow down on laxatives. Make sure they're hydrating well. They can use supportive medications like Imodium or Lamotil. Even cholecystyramine can be helpful. Make sure um, it's not related to GVHD because sometimes that can really cause excessive diarrhea. Make sure they're eating appropriately and treat infections if you think that's the cause. So now we have infusion-related reactions as a problem for our myeloma patients. Um, we're lucky to have this. Usually our lymphoma colleagues had to deal with this. Now we do too. So we don't really understand what the mechanism is, but we think it's some sort of cytokine release. And if it usually occurs, it's usually really quickly and usually with the first infusion. And the symptoms can range. So I always tell my patients if they feel strange in any way during the infusion, let your nurse know. So how do we manage it? The best ways to prevent it. So make sure your patient's adequately pre-medicated. Start low and slow. And there's some parameters for certain monoclonal antibodies. So there's a risk of having a delayed re um, reaction with daratumumab up to 48 hours after getting the drug. So patients need to take prednisone for two days after. Elotuzumab, they need to take it before they come and see you. And how we manage it, stop the infusion, of course. Give them more supportive medications. If you're worried about airway obstruction, make sure you have epinephrine and make sure they're getting fluid. Fluids. We do see some skin reactions from time to time. Make sure they're taking antihistamines, topical corticosteroids. We can see injection site reactions with bortezomib. It's important to use the air sandwich technique to help reduce this. Make sure you're rotating the site of injection to help minimize this. Uh, dyspnea can happen sometimes from drugs or underlying issues. We have a ton of risk factors that can cause this. Make sure you're asking your patient if they're smoking and make sure they're not smoking. They can sneak by us with that a lot of the time. And so we manage this by basically correcting issues that can cause it. So if it's heart failure doing it, make sure we're getting a repeat echocardiogram. If we think it's a clot, do a VQ scan. And sometimes patients need supplemental medications to get them through. So just in summary, we basically have a lot of survival improvements with our new novel agents, but it can also lead to comorbidity. So it's, and the, the adverse effects that can happen can happen related to pre-existing risk factors, the disease state, and the treatment regimen that we're giving them. And a lot of this can really be potentiated by understanding what the risk factors are, because we know a lot of these adverse effects can be managed more properly if we prevent it and harder to control once they happen. And we know that if we can control this well and recognize it well, we can improve our patient's quality of life. That's it. Thank you. I tried to wrap it up. Thanks, sweetie. <laughs> so she only has like three minutes because she has to go speak yeah. next door. Yeah. Who's got pressing questions for Amy? Please. I just have one. You said with the hypercalcemia, I was wondering if you probably don't recommend vitamin D. Actually, vitamin D is really important. But um, the hypercalcemia usually is from the underlying myeloma itself, not, not mostly because a patient has taken a lot of calcium or Tums, although that does happen. It's really from the underlying myeloma itself, so treating the myeloma mm -hmm. and also um, supporting them with like calcitonin or bisphosphonates and fluids to correct the hypercalcemia. But it's really important for patients to stay on vitamin D, particularly living in the Northeast. We're all very vitamin D, D deficient here. You don't fear it would you know, make the matters worse by increasing the Calcium. No, I, I don't think it's going to make the matters worse. But of course, watch your patient's calcium levels. Okay. 
So that, that one of the issues with vitamin D and calcium supplementation, because especially because you're dealing with an older population, particularly the women, mm -hmm. they're on calcium and vitamin D because that's what their doctors tell them to take all the time. Yeah. We, those, those are actually very important to make the bisphosphonates work better. Mm -hmm. But we don't usually recommend them until their myeloma is under control. So they need to take a holiday from their vitamin D calcium until we get their disease under control. And then they actually can go back on it because it does make, you know, it makes the, the bisphosphonates work better. Okay. So they need to take a holiday, make sure they're not hypercalcemic because they're taking exogenous calcium, control their disease, put them back on it because it helps their bones. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Any uh, prospects how soon that uh, extreme is going to get improved? Because there are some patients with renal dysfunction you don't even want to use Iridia with. So there and, is a... You know, and sometimes <coughs> your, you and your colleagues recommend we use Exgeva in these patients so, so we can't get it. We can mm -hmm. use Exgeva for... We can for only use Exgeva in refractory hypercalcemia. Mm -hmm. right. It is a proof for that. Mm -hmm. right. So if they're on a bisphosphonate, they become hypercalcemic, you can give them Exgeva. Do you have any... Ed, do you have any idea when the denosumab... <laughs> yeah, no, I know that. I've been waiting the trial's been myeloma. done right. yeah. in myeloma. <laughs> they didn't approve it. Now, if you look at the original Exgeva trial, there was only, there was a handful, there was like 200 or something like that out of the 1,800 patients. And they didn't feel, the FDA didn't think that was a large enough subpopulation to approve it. So a couple years later, the company finally decided to do an Exgeva versus zoledronic acid study. It's been done. The results are not available, so we can't answer that question.